So we will start with the peace chant. You can join me if you like. Let me get it back here. All right, we can start. Om Bhadram Karne Bhe Shrinu Yama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Stushtu Vagum Sastanu Bhihi Vyashe Ma Deva Hitanyadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridha Shrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swasti nastar kshyo arishtanemihi, swasti no brihaspatir dadhatu, om shanti shanti shanti. So we have seen the waking and the dreaming and the deep sleep. Um, the investigation was into the self into who am I or what am I. And the way the investigation is being carried out is the self has four aspects, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, the waker and the dreamer and the deep sleeper. And what the Upanishad claims is the real self. That will be the fourth one. So now we are ready to investigate the fourth one. This will be the uh, seventh mantra. Uh, we have these karikas, these verses which we are going to skip. Karika up to nine, yes, and now the seventh mantra, yes. So mantra number seven is the climax of this Upanishad. Some of you are looking puzzled. What did we just skip? Don't worry, we didn't skip anything. I've explained whatever was there in those karikas. Those are explanations of the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, various aspects of that, what we have taken a look at. Now the Upanishad wants to point out that we are pure consciousness underlying the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Transcending them, underlying them. Immanent and transcendent. It's like, suppose a person doesn't, doesn't understand what gold is. You want to point out that the reality of the ornaments, the necklace, the tiara, and the bracelet, the reality behind them is gold. You want to point it out. How do you do that? You have now introduced them to the necklace. You've shown them the necklace. You've shown them the bracelet. You've shown them the tiara. Now, how are you going to explain what gold is right there? So that is the task taken up by the um, seventh mantra. I personally consider it, it's not only the climax of this most powerful and shortest of all the Upanishads, but I think it is one of the highest expressions of Vedanta philosophy in all the Upanishads found anywhere throughout the uh, Vedantic literature. Extraordinary, very powerful. If you wanted to speak about the ultimate reality, about the absolute, this is the most that could be said. Beyond this lies only silence. I met this person um, at uh, Harvard. There's an, an institute called the Harvard Yenjing Institute, which is an institute for Chinese studies. And uh, there's this scholar who said, come to my presentation tomorrow because I'm going to talk about silence. Talk about silence. <laughs> so his subject for this PhD thesis is silence in Buddhism, in Buddhist philosophy. And his guide was telling us, this scholar, uh, he's from Taiwan, uh, he is doing two PhDs simultaneously. There are people who have done one after another, but two PhDs simultaneously, and that level at Harvard also. <laughs> And he was encouraging other scholars, if any of you have any spare time, maybe you could consider one more PhD. And they all went, no, 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 we don't want one more PhD. But anyway, so he said uh, in his presentation, the, when you have expressed in words the maximum that you can, the most profound thing that you can, beyond that lies only silence, whether in Vedanta or in Buddhist philosophy. So this is the most that can be said. But remember, this is a pointer. It's pointing out, like that story I told you, this is the Harvard Business School. Like that, it's pointing out to our real self. We have to catch what is being said here. Three steps to understand this. First, what does the Upanishad say? The exact, exact teaching. And then second, do I understand it? Do I get it? 
Number three, is it true? Is it real? So when I say, there is a paper in my hand, what did I say? There's a paper in my hand. Do I understand it? Yes, the Swami said there's a paper in my hand. Is it true? Let me check. Let me take a look. Yes, he's holding a paper in the hand. Similarly, check within oneself. What are they trying to say? And see if we get it. All right, enough advertisement. We'll go into it now. Uh, please follow with the chant. Uh, I'll chant and then you chant after me. Nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam. Nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam. No bhayata pragyam na pragyana ghanam. Na pragyam na pragyam. Na pragyam na pragyam. Adrishyam abhyavaharyam. Agrahyam alakshanam, agrahyam alakshanam, achintyam abhyapadeshyam, ekatma pratyasaram, prapanchopashamam shantam, chopashamam shantam, shiva madvaitam, chaturtham manyante, Sa atma sa vigyaha. What does it mean? We're talking about the fourth. You keep saying that our real nature is pure consciousness. But what is this pure? What does it mean, pure consciousness? By the way, pure consciousness does not mean a very good, a nice consciousness. It means consciousness without any object. Consciousness as it is. So what does it mean exactly? How, do I, how am I to understand it here? It says, <coughs> what is this fourth? What is gold? It's like, it's saying, nantaf pragyam. It is not the consciousness turned inwards, which, which means it's not the dreamer. It's not the dream consciousness, what you have experienced as the dreamer in the mantra number four. Not that. Na bahish pragyam. It is not the externalized consciousness either. Uh, that means the waker. It's not the dreamer. It's not the waker. Now, Bhayata Pragyam, it's not something in between. Some might think, you're talking about waking, dreaming, deep sleep, but there are other states too, you know, altered states of consciousness. So someone could be high on uh, drugs or something like that. So that's also a kind of experience. Why is that not mentioned? It's mentioned here. Ubhayata Pragyam means in between. There are any kind, many kinds of different kinds of experiences. Um, whether it is induced by drugs or maybe by illness or by um, a higher practices of cultivating different states of mind, whatever it is, that ultimate reality about ourselves, pure consciousness, is not it. It's, n it's none of those. No bhayata pragyam. Na pragyana ghanam. It's not the deep sleeper either. No. So it's not what we experience as the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper, not something in between. So, um, is it the consciousness of God? Are we talking about the all-knowing God consciousness, the consciousness that, that the awareness that God has, knowing everything, omniscience? Is the is it? Are you talking about that? Na pragyam? No, not even that. So, no consciousness at all, like uh, some insentient matter. No consciousness. Na apragyam, not even that. So what was said here in the first line, it's not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper. I think what waker, dreamer? Our own experience as waking and dreaming and deep sleeping, none of those. It's not something in between. It's not some omniscient consciousness of, uh, uh, of God, not the omniscient mind of God. It's not non-conscious either. It's not unconscious either. What is it? Why is this happening? Shankaracharya in his commentary says, look at how the other three were introduced. How was the waking introduced? When the consciousness is extroverted, functioning through the mind and the sense organs and experiences the external world, that is waking. How was the dream consciousness introduced? When the mind turns inwards and experiences uh, objects within itself, that was dream. So why not say outright what is the fourth? 
Notice how the fourth is being introduced, by denying the other three. This is the process of neti neti, not this, not this. Because it cannot be said directly. It cannot be said directly. It has to, it has to be denied. It's like, you're having shown the necklace and the bracelet and the tiara, now you want to teach what is gold. Suppose a person does not understand what is gold. You want to show what is gold there. The way to do it is, you've seen the necklace, but gold is not the necklace. It's there, but it's not necklace in itself. Gold is not a bracelet. Gold is not a tiara, but it's there. What's common to all of them, leaving out what's different among each other, what's the underlying reality of all of them? That is gold. Because if you directly point to a necklace and say, this is gold, what will happen? The person will take the ornament as gold. And suppose next time the necklace is melted and made into a bracelet, the person will say gold is gone because it's, I can't see the necklace anymore. How do you make the person see the background? It's like uh, one of the Swamis gave a very nice example. Um, uh, I like this very much. It's like this, you know, like a, like a movie screen. This person, he goes um, with his little son from the village to the big city to show the son, uh, the child, a cinema. And on the way, he tells the child that a cinema is a big screen and there is light on it and there's pictures on it and, of course, there'll be sound and that's a cinema. And they go and when they enter the cinema, the film uh, theater, the film has already started. And that's important because when we enter life, the world, the film has already started. We, are, we don't see it from the beginning. That would have solved many mysteries. We see it when the movie is already happening. Mom and dad are there and the world is there and school is there and all of those things are there. Um, and the, they sit down and the child gets engrossed in the movie. I sort of think it could be the Mahabharata movie or something like that. Um, and after some time, watching the movie for some time, the child starts whispering questions to his father. Father, where's the screen you mentioned? It's like after living life for some time, then we start asking questions. What's going on here? Wait a minute. It's all nice, but what's going on here? So where is the screen? You said there is a screen. And the father says, it's there, right there in front of you. Oh, you mean maybe it's the Mahabharata when Arjuna and Krishna, Krishna is telling the Gita to Arjuna, something like that, maybe a movie like that. Um, oh, you mean Arjuna? No, 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 behind him. Just behind. Oh, you mean Krishna? No, no, behind Krishna too. Oh, you mean the chariot? No, behind the chariot. You mean the battlefield? No, behind the battlefield. Oh, the sky is the screen. No, 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 behind. Just leave all of it out. Oh, you mean the screen is nothing? No, no, screen is not nothing. It's The whole thing is the screen. Oh, you mean the screen is the battlefield and Arjuna and Krishna and the chariot together? What will the father point to? Because whatever points to, there's a picture there. And the child takes the picture to be that reality. And that's the problem with the Upanishad and enlightened people when they want to point out. Here, look, here is Brahman. Here is the ultimate reality. We say, oh, you mean this table or this person? Or you mean the sun and the earth? No, no, no. Leave it all out. Oh, you mean Brahman is nothing? No, no, no. All of it. Oh, you mean a collection of these things? No, no, no. None of these. How do you point it out? The method is this. Not this, not this. Neti, neti. So neither the waker, nor the dreamer, not the deep sleeper, not in something in between, um, not omniscience of God, not unconscious either. The awareness itself without any object. Then the next part. And that, there's an awfully long word there. You can see that? So, <laughs> yeah, I broke it up for you. The way to pronounce it is actually together. You Believe it or not, you should <laughs> read it together. It goes like this. Adrishyam abhyavaharyam agrahyam alakshanam achintyam abhyapadeshyam ekatma pratyasaram prapancho upashamam shantam shivam advaitam. Should read it. The whole thing is to be read at one go. But when you explain it, you break it into the component words. This is also neti neti. But what's happening here? What is this Brahman? What is this ultimate reality? Is it something that we can see? 
adrishyam. It's not, literally it means invisible, but it means it's not an object for our sense organs. So this reality we're talking about, the fourth, you cannot see it, you cannot hear it, you cannot touch it, you cannot smell it, you cannot taste it. That's the meaning of adrishyam, not an object to our senses. Um, you know, sometimes silly questions come. Oh, if this precious Brahman or ultimate reality of yours exists, why can't I see it? Because it's not seeable. It's like saying, oh, if your atoms exist, why can't I see atoms? Because atoms are too small to see, and therefore you cannot see them. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. They do exist. And the fourth, this, this pure consciousness, it's not an object of vision. Therefore, you cannot see it with the eyes or smell it or taste it or touch it or taste it. Um, or uh, um, hear it. Can I, uh, can, is it an object to my organs of action? Can I walk to it? Maybe I can go to Benares, the holy city, or Mecca, or Jerusalem, and then I can see the, get the ultimate reality there. Can I grasp it, hold it with my hands? No. I'm skipping one word. Agrahyam. Agrahyam means it is... Um, it is not an object to my organs of action. You can't walk to it on a pilgrimage. You can't catch hold of it. No. It is beyond any transaction. Abhyavaharyam, the word in between which I skipped. Abhyavaharyam means it's beyond any transaction. Gold, for example, to be useful, you make it into an ornament. But if without the ornament name form, there is no use to it also. Pure consciousness in itself does not enter into transactions. It's only through the mind and the senses that you have. You can see things, hear things, smell things, taste things. You can think, um, you can remember, you can understand, you can desire or hate. It requires the mind. But consciousness in itself is not something that sees, hears, smells or tastes. It's not something that enters into transaction. Um, Ultimate reality is the most useless thing of all. <laughs> but it's, it underlies all use. See, gold in itself, you can't wear it as a necklace or put it as a bracelet. But once it's made into a necklace, being a necklace or a bracelet, it depends on the gold. Without the gold, no necklace, no bracelet. You can't put a pretty ornament on your wrist or on your neck without the gold. Similarly, without this underlying consciousness, this fourth, everything else is not possible. Everything else means seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, thinking, desiring, understanding, Vedanta. None of it is possible without that underlying consciousness. But in itself, it does not enter into any kind of transaction. So, avyavahadyam. Alakshanam. It cannot be inferred. It's a technical use. Lakshana here means it cannot be inferred inference is by seeing something you understand something else so the classic example is there is a fire on that hill I can't see the fire but I can see the smoke so there must be a fire by seeing the smoke I infer the fire so by seeing something by noticing something can you infer that fourth the ultimate reality the pure consciousness that also is not possible Ajintyam avyapadeshyam Abhyapadeshyam means beyond name, beyond language. And achintyam means beyond thought. We often hear this again and again. The ultimate reality is beyond language. Language cannot express it. But what do you mean? Why can't words express it? Why can't language express it? Uh, that uh, scholar I was talking about who is doing his PhD on silence, somebody joked that that's an awful lot of things to say about silence. <laughs> Big thesis about silence. Avyapadeshyam. Why do you keep saying that the ultimate reality is beyond language? Why cannot words express it? And remember, you are using words to express it. After all, all of this is words. The Upanishad is words. So this has to be understood. Shankaracharya, he explains it beautifully in his commentary. Why is this ultimate reality, the fourth, Brahman, and the ultimate reality of this universe, why is it beyond language? What can language do? Shankaracharya, he uh, asks there, 
how does language work? Language requires these five things to work. Any one of five factors, if it is present, language can work. And all of this is based on Shankara's commentary. It says, first of all, jati. Jati means class or species. So if an object belongs to a set or a class, then you can use that to refer to that language, uh, uh, to, to that object. You can use language. So example he gives is um, cow. So this animal is a cow because there's a set of animals called cows and this, this animal shares those characteristics. You can put it in that set and use the name to indicate this object. So a car, anything that is a part of a set, a boat, it could be a small boat, it could be a huge cruise ship, but you can call them all boats because they belong to a set of boats. So can you talk about Brahman like that? No, because there is no class of ultimate realities. There's only one. So you cannot use language as a class to designate Brahman. Here is an ultimate reality. There are lots of these ultimate realities, you know, here's one of them. But no, there's no lots of ultimate realities. It's not a class of things. Another way language functions is by quality. So there are flowers there. And if I say, bring me a red flower, immediately you know, white flower, yellow flower, red flower is there. The Swami wants a red flower. You pick out the correct one and bring it to me. How did you know? How did language work? I use the quality red to distinguish that flower from other flowers having different qualities. Some have um, white colors, some have um, yellow colors, but some have red. And you used that quality to distinguish it from everything else. That tall person, call him. How did you know whom to call? You looked, uh, who's the tallest one among these people? A quality. So quality can be used to designate something. Language works sometimes through quality. In Sanskrit, guna, quality. But you immediately know Brahman is beyond all, all qualities. It is called nirguna, beyond all attributes. So it, Brahman has no quality of its own. All of quality belongs to something in waking, dreaming, or deep sleep, but not to Brahman. So you cannot use quality. Another way language functions is through action. Action. Um, compliment the cook. The dishes are wonderful. Now, who, whom do you know to, how do you know whom to compliment? The one who cooked these dishes. Cooking is a function. Call the, call the boatman. The passengers are ready to depart. How do you know whom to call? The one who drives the boat. So, function. One way language works is through function. If something or someone is doing something, use that action to designate that person. But Brahman, the ultimate reality, pure consciousness, has no function. It just is. It's isness. It just is. It, it shines. That's all. It's not a function. You cannot use function to designate that, that fourth, the ultimate reality. Um, then there is another way language functions is... Uh, look, language functions. <laughs> There's another way that language functions is relationship, sambandha. The guru. The guru is a guru only when there is a student. Without any students, you can't call the guru, the, the teacher, a teacher. Father. The father is a father only if there's a son or daughter. So there's a relationship. And relationship requires two. You can use, use language through relationship. But relationship requires at least two terms. There cannot be two terms because the ultimate reality is non-dual, without two. So therefore, you cannot say language. You can use relationships to in indicate um, Brahman or Turiya. It has no relation with anything else. Why? Because nothing else exists. How can it have a relationship? It's like saying the screen. What relationship does it have with the character of the movies? Nothing really. They don't exist. Only the screen exists. But the other way is not true. The mo characters in the movie, the movie itself depends on the screen. The world entirely depends on Brahman. But Brahman does not depend on the world. Brahman has no relationship with the world. The classic example of snake and rope. So, you know the example? By mistake, sometimes a rope is taken to be or mistaken to be a snake. In the darkness, maybe you see something, oh, it's a snake. Sometimes the opposite happens. So you have to be careful. 
They say, oh, it's a rope. It must be a rope. The Swami keeps talking about rope and snake. What did he say? The snake is actually a rope. Okay. But sometimes it turns out to be a snake. <laughs> Whatever it is, a mistake is made. What it is not, you take it to be that. So it's not a snake, but you take it to be a snake. It's a rope. Now, between the real rope and the imaginary snake, what relationship is there? If you catch hold of the rope and put him uh, and, and interrogate the rope, hey, you, what's your relationship with that nasty snake? And the rope will say, what snake? It's your problem. I see a snake there. It's your problem. I'm not a snake. <laughs> so similarly, if you ask Brahman, what's your relationship with the world? Brahman will say, what world? <laughs> you think there's a world. There's no world. There's only Brahman. So it has no relation with anything else. You can't use relation to indicate Brahman. And the last one is called convention. Convention is very simple. It's like when you name a baby, you call a baby um, Ram or Sita, and say, from now on, this child will be called Ram or Sita. How did you know? How do you use language? You pointed out this child, and from now on it's called Ram or Sita. Why can't we use a name like that? After all, you're using names. You're saying Brahman, Atman, whatever, the ultimate reality, the absolute, pure consciousness. You're using so many names, Swami. But is it? does it work like that? If you, How does this naming, this convention work? You must point out the person. This person is Ram. Then only it works. If I say, if I don't point out and I say this person is Ram, you'll be at a loss. Which person? What are you talk who are you talking about? If I don't point it out, designation is important. This is this is called X is called Y. You must point out what is X and then you understand, oh, this is called Y. But if you don't point out, if you simply say X is Y, nobody knows what are you talking about. Similarly, even when we are using words, Atman, Brahman, Turiya, um, the fourth, ultimate reality, absolute, none of us are any wiser because it's not been pointed out. It cannot be pointed out directly, physically, that you can't point out, this is Brahman. Here, from now on, we'll call this Brahman. So now you know, oh, a table is Brahman. It's not. But uh, <laughs> because it cannot be pointed out, this conventional method of naming, that from now on, let's call it this, it can't work. The five ways in which language works do not apply to Brahman. The ultimate reality, the five ways do not apply. Jati, uh, class or species, won't work because Brahman is, uh, there's no class of Brahman. Um, guna, quality, won't work because Brahman has, has no qualities, nid guna. Action, kriya, uh, won't work because there's no action in the absolute reality. There's no change. Um, sambandha, relationship, won't work. Because Brahman is non-dual. There's no second thing. It has no relation with anything else. And then, last one, conventional method in Sanskrit, it's called Rudi. Um, conventionally, can you name it? No, you cannot name it because you cannot point it out. Uh, you cannot separate it from everything else and say, this thing is... If you try to point it out, what happens? It's like that father trying to point out the um, screen in the movie. You'll immediately mistake a picture from the screen. So none of these work. That's why it is beyond language. And all of this explanation which I gave to you now, the philosophy of language and why it will not work, why you cannot indicate the ultimate reality through language, all of this Shankaracharya says in half a phrase. Shabda pravritti nimitta rahitatvat. Because the ultimate reality is devoid of the, um, the how do I translate it? the instigators of the activity of language, let's say this way. The five factors which instigate the use of language, those are not there in the ultimate reality, and therefore it cannot be uh, designated by language. Abhyapadeshyam, beyond thought, you cannot conceive of it. Consciousness is what reveals thought. Thought does not reveal consciousness. Consciousness reveals thought, and thought is about the world. Thought reveals the world. By my mind, I understand my body and my senses, and through the body and senses, I experience a world. But consciousness, but mind does not reveal consciousness itself. It's rather consciousness which reveals the mind. Achintyam, it cannot be thought of. 
So up to this point is still neti neti. Have you noticed? The first line was, so you, this whole thing you can divide into three parts. One part is, it starts with nanta pragyam and ends with na apragyam. The first, first line. Uh, there, by neti neti, the knower is denied. Waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, no, no, no. And by the next part, from the big word here, adrishyam, from there up to abhyapadeshyam, halfway through. That's the second part. The second part denies the knowables. <laughs> Notice what is here. Anything that you can experience with the senses, anything that you can grasp with the uh, organs of action, anything that one can infer, anything that one can talk about, anything that one can think about, all of, or anything that you can, uh, yeah, inference. So all of these things, they work on the world, objects, and none of them are Brahman. So they are knowables. What, what we did in the first three aspects of the self, Remember, we had two things, knower and known, waker and waker's world, dreamer and the dream world, deep sleep and the darkness of deep sleep. Knower, knowables. These two pairs are denied. These two pairs are denied in the 1980. The knower is denied in uh, the first part and the knowables, the waking world, dream world, deep sleep, potential world, they are all denied in the second part. Now, Having said, it's not this, not this. Can you at least indicate what it is? You have told us what it is not. But can you give us some idea of inkling of what it is? And the next part, the third part, indicates, not directly, because words cannot denote it directly. It points at what the ultimate reality is. Remember, nothing weird or nothing far off. It is us. It's our real nature. It just cannot be expressed in certain language, but it can be pointed out. So the pointing is given here in the third part. Ekatma pratyasaram. Ekatma pratyasaram. By following, by tracing this cognition of I, all the time we have this feeling. The cognition itself is the ego. It's a function of the mind. I, 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 but it refers to something. It's pointing out something. Uh, if you follow, this was the entire method given by Ramana Maharshi. So the central method that was taught by Ramana Maharshi was follow that who am I? Whatever you ask him, he'll say who's asking? Find that out. So that's a shortcut solution to all problems. I am in great suffering, find out who is in suffering. So who am I? That's what's being pointed out here. Ekatma pratyasaram. If you follow the I thought back to its source. There's a funny story about, and later it was confirmed that it's true. Um, somebody, it actually happened. Somebody who was very devotional by nature, who did not like this path of knowledge, this who am I business. But he went to Ramana Maharshi anyway, because Ramana Maharshi was so famous in the south of India at that time. This great sage who lived on the mountain there in Arunachala, he went there and asked Ramana Maharshi, you know, I know you're going to tell me, find out who am I, but I don't like that method. It's so dry, it's so intellectual. Um, I love God. I have great devotion to God, Narayana, to Narayana, a great devotion to Narayana. Is that all right? And Ramana Maharshi said, yes. It's all right, yes. So if I have great devotion to Narayana, after death, will I go to the abode of Narayana, to Vaikuntha, the abode of Narayana? And Ramana Maharshi said, yes, you will. I will, yes. And there, will I see Narayana? Will I behold my beloved Lord? And Ramana Maharshi said, yes, you will. Oh, I will see God, yes. And will Narayana see me? Will he see me? Yes, he will. Will he speak to me? Will he speak to me? Yes, he will. What will Narayana say to me? What will Narayana say to me? He'll say to you, find out who am I. <laughs> <laughs> so his uh, the whole method was ekatma pratyasaram. Tracing the I to what is beyond the I. Uh, the classic Chinese metaphor of finger pointing at the moon. 
So this ekatma pratyasara, this is not a definition of the ultimate reality, but it's pointing to the ultimate reality. When you use a thing, what is the moon? I'm pointing to the moon. This is not the moon, but you have to follow this and then see for yourself what this is pointing towards. Similarly, these words are pointing towards something within us which we have to catch ourselves. What is the... Uh, an another way of saying it, prapanchopashamam, a very beautiful word. Prapanchopashamam means the cessation of the universe, the silence of the universe. What a beautiful, powerful e expression. That absolute is the silence of the universe. The, the entire universe falls silent. What is the universe? According to in the language of Mandukya, the universe is our waking universe, this one. Whatever you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, this is the universe. But it's also the internal universe of our dreams. Whatever we dream about, whatever we think about, whatever we remember and conceive of and love and hate and want internally. The first person experience of the mind, that is also the universe. And it is also the potential universe of deep sleep. So the universe has these three aspects. The waking the dreaming and the deep sleep, everything that is in the waking state, everything that is in the dream state, that means the internal universe, and everything that is in the deep sleep state, together is called universe. The word here used here is prapancha. Uh, it needs some explanation. Prapancha stands for, in most Indian languages, you come across this word, prapancha. Pancha means five. Prapancha means the five in detail. What five? You know, the ancient cosmology of five elements, and the sky and the air and the fire and the water and the earth. So in ancient, cosm not only in India, in China, even in Greece. And so they thought of the world as made of these five elements. Uh, Panchabhuta, the five, five elements. So the universe is made of these five elements. And um, um, there's a logic to it. Why these five elements? One is a simple way of looking at the universe. So you find the sky, space, and you find heat, fire, you find water, and you find earth. Um, so you find these five elements here. There is a more s philosophical, deeper way of understanding these five elements. The way we experience a world is through our five senses. And these five elements provide... What do the five senses experience? The five senses experience... Eyes experience form, and the uh, skin experiences touch. The um, um, nose experiences smell. The tongue experiences taste. The ears experience sound. Now these five objects of our experience, form, sound, taste, touch, and uh, what was the other one? Smell. These five, they are properties of five elements. So sound is taken to be the property of space. And f uh, form is taken to be the property of um, fire. And uh, touch is taken to be the property of air. And taste is taken to be the property of water. And smell is taken to be the property of earth. So the five elements, they, they have these five properties, which is how we experience the world. So this is the logic behind the five elements constituting the world. It means the world, notice it's very subjective. So it's the world of our experience. All right. Just by the way, somebody might ask, uh, but you just talked about the human senses. There are uh, animals with other kinds of sense. Someone might have an electri electric sense or an infrared or something like that. So remember, this is the entire technology of the Upanishads is meant to give us liberation. So the whole thing is imagined, is constructed around us, our, our experience of the world. That's why five senses. So five elements constitute the world. The five in detail. The five are the five elements. Five in detail, world. In Sanskrit, prapancha. Pancha, five. Prapancha, the five in detail. Funny story, but <laughs> I'll see if I can make it work. It works very well in Hindi. It has to be. It's an, a story about monks in the Himalayas. Um, imagine 
high up in the mountains, 10,000, 15,000 feet up in the, in, the, in the mountains there. In the winter, it gets very cold. It's covered in snow and ice. And there are no heating facilities, except for if you build a fire, that might, might be it. So um, there are pilgrimage sites where monks congregate, and in the summer, pilgrims from the plains of India go there. But when winter falls and the snow starts coming down, everybody goes away, and the pilgrimage sites shut down for the winter. There's nobody there. But a few hardy monks, they remain. They remain in caves and in, in huts, even now. And when these pilgrimage, so this is the place where these monks get food. The pilgrimage sites, there are, they are called Annakshetras, where food is given to monks. And when the food distribution centers shut down for winter, before shutting down, they call all the monks and give them some provisions for the winter. Some amount of rice, some amount of fuel, maybe some amount of uh, cereals or whatever, what they might use for the next five or six months before uh, everybody comes back and the centers reopen. So all this is background to the story. Now, at one point, s some monks were called to the center before it closed down for winter, and they were all given things, including a block of, um, in Hindi it's called gur, molasses, jaggery, molasses, like sugar. So that's your sugar for <laughs> the next six months. It's like a brick. Um, and the monks... They packed it and they took it back to their huts. So these two friends, they were monks. They're going back to the huts with their supplies, including the brick of, um, it's like basically sugar. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the, the, the molasses. And this monk goes to his hut and he unties the packet and breaks off a little bit of it and tastes it. Oh, nice. Very sweet. Eats a little bit and then packs it up. And then you have to hang it from the ceiling because there are rats. If you keep it on the floor, the rats will come and eat it. So the, uh, he hangs it from the ceiling with the rope and then puts out the lamp and goes to sleep. Now, when he's sleeping, he feels, I could have eaten a little more. And uh, he said, all right, let me just take it just a little more. And he lights the lamp and he brings it down from the ceiling and he unpacks it and breaks off a little more, a little more and eats it. And then packs it and ties it up and hangs it on the ceiling, puts out the lamp, goes to sleep. But no sooner than he has, maybe just a little more. And then he gets up again and repeats it. Next morning, his friend comes. And he finds the rope hanging from the ceiling and the packet is empty. There's, there's no more molasses. And he asks, what happened to it? He says, oh, that, I wiped out the prapancha. Prapancha ko mitadia in Hindi. What it means is, I wiped out the universe, this universe of temptation which was there in front of which means he ate the whole thing, six months applied throughout the night. <laughs> I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> I saw this interview on, on, um, on YouTube uh, of the Dalai Lama by a Western journalist who tried a joke on His Holiness. It didn't work. It went terribly wrong. <laughs> The joke is a very famous one, especially in New York. Um, somebody goes to a place where pizzas are given. You know, pizzas are sold. And he says, how, how, how do you want it? And the customer says, make me one with everything. One pizza with every topping. Or make me one with everything. <laughs> you know, the, the, the s united with the, <laughs> yes. So the journalist thought he would try it on, the, uh, on his holiness. And you can see, actually see it. Uh, on, on YouTube, he asks, uh, so there's this guy who goes to the pizza shop and he asks the pizza guy, make me one with everything. Uh, and he looks at the D Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama says, pizza is good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the journalist says, oh, I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> but anyway, prapanch ko mitadia. That means uh, I have wiped out the prapancha, the, the, the universe made of five elements, which means that actually the, sh the sugar which was tempting him. Prapancha upashamam, the real way of wiping out the prapancha of the universe is, is Vedanta, where in the fourth, there is no universe. Where is the universe? In the waking, here. In the dream also, there's a subtle universe. And in deep sleep, there seems to be nothing, but everything is there in a seed form because it comes back. The moment you wake up, it all comes back again. 
So the universe is there in a manifest form in the waking and the dreaming and in an unmanifest form in deep sleep. But in the fourth, neither waking, nor dreaming, nor deep sleep, in the fourth, there's no universe. There is no snake in the rope. It's like this. Um, the classic example which Shankaracharya uses is a pot. And why a pot, you might say. Because I'm sure there were lots of pots around. In, uh, in the, there's the most common thing. When you excavate an, an ancient civilization, what's the first thing that you come across? Pottery, basically. If you go to a museum, you'll find, among all other things, lots of pottery will be there. So pot. He says, take an ex example of a pot. Now, a pot, you take a pot, clay pot, and then you examine it. You find that it's made of clay. So then now you have two things, clay and a pot. But when you examine the clay pot, you find the top is clay, the bottom is clay, inside it's clay, outside it's clay. It's clay through and through. Every bit of it, what you touch is clay. What you weigh is the clay. So this is clay. Where is the pot? You have used two words. One is clay, one is pot. The clay is this, this thing then what is the object corresponding to the word pot? There is no separate object corresponding to the word pot. The word pot actually means a shape and a use. But the material is clay. Now once you understand this, there is no reality called the pot. In the clay, it's clay only. There is no separate reality called the pot. Similarly, when we understand the fourth this pure consciousness, you realize all that we thought are the knower and the known, the universe, waking universe, dream universe, deep sleep, potential universe, all of this is nothing other than that fourth, other than yourself. Just like the pot is nothing other than the clay. There is no separate reality called pot. There is no separate reality called universe. That is the silence of the universe. When one realizes this, even with eyes open, even when you are experiencing the universe, you can honestly say, what universe? This is just Brahman shining forth. Every bit of it is that pure awareness which I am. All names and forms, waking, dreaming and deep sleep, depend on this pure awareness for their very existence. They have no separate existence. It's just that reality which I am. When we realize this with eyes open, when you are experiencing everything, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, you can still honestly say, all of this is awareness only. And with eyes closed in meditation, when you are not experiencing anything, it's still that pure awareness. Whether manifest or unmanifest, it's still that pure awareness. In waking, dreaming and deep sleep, this is prapanchopashama. That means the silence of the universe. What it also means is, Remember, the whole goal of all of this, way we started, overcoming suffering and attainment of bliss. That is the goal of Vedanta. This prapanchopashama, this realization of the silence of the universe is overcoming suffering forever. Think about it. There is suffering only because we think of a separate universe, something apart from us. If it is all me, it's all me, I alone, the pure consciousness, I the pure consciousness, not I the body. I alone appear as all of this. Then what is it here that I need to gain, to, to achieve, to earn, to, to, um, to acquire? Nothing. I'm all of that. What is it that I have to get rid of? What is it that I hate? I, I can't hate anything. I can't get rid of anything. All of it is me. And all of it is not. Only I, the pure consciousness, am. So this is prapanchopashama, the cessation of the universe. Very, very deep concept. One kind of cessation of the universe is in deep sleep, no experience. In nirvikalpa samadhi, universe is not experienced. But this is while experiencing the universe, you can honestly say it is not. I alone appear in all these forms. Prapanchopashamam. Because of this prapanchopashamam, shantam. Peace itself. Your real nature is peace itself. It's not peaceful. It is peace itself. Shantam, your name is peace. It's not that you are peaceful. 
your name itself is peace when the mind is peaceful you are peace itself when the mind is active you are still peace itself shantam even when the mind is restless you have the deep knowledge that i am peace itself shantam beyond all suffering shivam shivam here means auspiciousness that atman that uh, the fourth is bliss its very nature is not only existence not only consciousness but ananda its bliss there are discussions to be had on this but i won't go into it just suffice it to say the question which arises here is this bliss is it something that you experience you experience all, all kinds of happiness so is it a special kind of happiness that you experience no it is that which is experienced as happiness in the world in itself is not a kind of feeling or a kind of um, you know a kind of thrill not like that uh, it is rather you can say uh, infinitude wholeness completion purnatvam there is no sense of any lack there it's com- it's it's a total it's it's completion let's say infinitude no limit so shivam it is ananda advaitam non dual it's non dual non dual in what sense non dual means not to apart from it there is no second thing think about it this way the gold example is a good example apart from how many are there necklace one if you count the ornaments necklace one bracelet two the tiara three and the fourth one when you say gold you you might think that there are four well, how are you saying that there is not two there is in fact four no if you count the gold then counting the gold how many are there only gold because the necklace is nothing but gold the ornament the bracelet is nothing but gold the tiara is nothing but gold from the point of view of gold there is only gold there is no second thing look out there in the ocean how many waves you see swami thousands of waves it's impossible to count them if you try to count the waves you'll get thousands and ever changing but if i say count water as water one and non dual the 10000 waves are nothing other than the same water how do you know take the water away how many of those 10000 waves will be left one or two nothing will be left those waves are not a second reality apart from water the billions of entities in this world are not a second reality apart from you the consciousness from the apart from the fourth it is not a fourth that's the trick the upanishad has played it's not a fourth it is one without a second the fourth is actually one without the second why because apart from the fourth there is no waking no dreaming no deep sleep one two and three waker dreamer deep sleeper in sanskrit we learn the terms vishwa taijasa pragya waker dreamer deep sleeper and the fourth is called by gorapada it will be called turiya which means fourth the turiya is not uh, a fourth after waker dreamer deep sleeper rather waker dreamer deep sleeper are appearances of that turiya without like the ornaments are appearances of gold the 10000 waves are appearances of water you the pure consciousness you appear now as the waker some are desperately trying to stay as the waker they're making the transition into the dreamer and the deep sleeper it's natural um, vedanta is the best soporific <laughs> so waker dreamer and deep sleeper are not 1 2 and 3 with respect to turiya it is turiya alone which appears as those three turiya is non dual not two advaitam and the next this little humorous chaturtham manyante people think it is the fourth shankaracharya says ke manyante who thinks so agyaha fools think it is the fourth it is not the fourth the ultimate reality of ourselves is not the fourth it is the it's the one without a second but it seems to be the fourth seems to be the fourth in in which way waker one dreamer two deep sleeper three and the real self fourth it seems to be that but the first three are nothing but the manifestations of that fourth 
So there is actually one without a second. Chaturtam manyante, people think it is the fourth. Sa atma. So <laughs> here is a manifestation of the fourth. Sa atma, and that is the self. Sa vigyaha, it is to be realized. It is to be realized. Realized as what? I am Brahman. Or it was said earlier, I am Atma Brahma. This very self is the absolute. How do you realize it? In this way. What was done earlier? Take a look at the waking, your own waking experience. Take a look at the dream, your own dream experience. You don't have to go into a dream. Just from the waking state, you rec recollect what was it like. And reconstruct what was it like to be in deep sleep. And notice all of them come and go to you, the pure awareness. What is common to all of them? What is not common? Waking world is not common. Your entire life, our life consisting of all of this, it totally disappears in, in the dream state. And our dreams, they come and go. They totally disappear when you wake up or go into deep sleep. In deep sleep, none of it is there. But what is there in deep sleep and in waking and in dreaming? What is that one awareness, non-objective consciousness? Pure consciousness. That you are. That is the self. Once you realize that, you realize I am that all the time. Effortlessly, choicelessly so all the time. And there, there is no suffering. There, there is only infinitude, no limits at all. Yeah. And all of this is an appearance of that reality, of my own reality. Once that is realized, one goes beyond suffering, one lives on, Still the waking will come, the dream state will come, the deep sleep state will come. But this, this will continue as what is called a jivan mukta, uh, enlightened while living. And then the task is done. So this is the great um, statement of, uh, of the fourth, so-called, now we know, so-called fourth. Uh, this is the statement about our real nature, about Brahman, Another word is Brahman, another word is Atman, another word is Turiya, whatever you call it. The Buddhists call it the clear light of the void. A very beautiful state, uh, phrase, clear light of the void. You can see why it is called the clear light of the void. Uh, what is the void? Deep sleep. What is the void? Even wake, waking and dreaming, they're actually the void. They're empty in themselves. So the clear light of the void is that what you are. All the time, right now, it's that. And once this is realized, forever beyond suffering, that is moksha, that is nirvana. We will go, we'll dig deeper into this in the evening session. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri.